Are there any questions about the material from last class? Last May. I want to welcome the high school students here today. It certainly improves the, the high tone of the place. Probably it adds to the IQ as well. This is just the 10th class we've had on this subject. Um, and we, we're coming back today from a vacation of 14 weeks. Um, but this is just the, this simply the 10th lecture. Hey, Poppy's so good to see you all there. Rather than jump in right where we left off, which I think might be a bit much for those of you who did not leave off, I have in mind this morning to do two preliminary things. First, to give some consideration to the larger context, the historical significance of the Fertile Crescent. It's the first thing I want to do this morning. The second thing would be a summary of what we have studied in class so far. We haven't done that much. We've taken the reign of Saul. In fact, we spent far more time on Saul than either of his successors. Um, Saul tends not, he tends to be neglected uh, in, in the study of biblical history. But uh, those of you who were here for the classes in the spring surely have much better sense of, of Saul's significance, uh, not the theological significance, which is kind of negative, but Saul's contribution to Israel's entry into the international world. First, let's look at, I want to say some things about the larger setting, the historical significance of the Fertile Crescent. Now, when I think of the Fertile Crescent, it's not entirely enclosed. The fertile, so many things that we take for granted began in the Fertile Crescent, but the Fertile Crescent spilled out. There were roadways. The most obvious place that spilled out was into Egypt. So some people actually make Egypt part of the Fertile Crescent, uh, which I, is, one can do that. It's very difficult to think of, of, the, of the culture and history of the Fertile Crescent and leave out Egypt, for crying out loud. But also the East, on the other side of the Persian Gulf, especially India. Uh, but, but also, up to the northwest of the Fertile Crescent, they're moving out into the Aegean Sea. Uh, the Anatolian Peninsula, out of the Aegean Sea. That, that's, a, that's a continuity. So when I'm thinking about the Fertile Crescent, it's, it's not an enclosed thing entirely. Uh, we, we call it Fertile Crescent because that's the way it looks. Back when, uh, back when I was first talking about this when I first came here, almost every single day on the front page of your daily paper, almost every single day, usually on the front page, there was a map of the Fertile Crescent. It was there, the map. Because of things that happened, well, 21 years ago today. There was a map. In fact, if you, if you were having a crescent roll for, for breakfast, you could just take that crescent roll and put it right on top of the map, and you can see exactly why it's called the Fertile Crescent. Uh, of course, in my days, they called that a crescent roll. Now it's known as a croissant. <laughs> a croissant. Because if you call it a croissant, it, it tastes so much delicieux. <laughs> I want to look a little bit at the, the, the larger setting, the historical 
significance of the Fertile Crescent. Because everything that takes place in the Hebrew Bible takes place inside the Fertile Crescent. <laughs> everything. Counting, of course, Egypt. This part of the globe is often called the cradle of civilization. I can say this much, it's certainly the cradle of our civilization. Now, I wrote these notes without the need of a map of the area. I see I'm all ready to have discouraged the high school students. Their teacher. Their teacher showed up. Oh, come back, please, come back. <laughs> so, so I wrote these notes without feeling the need for a map of the area. Uh, so I, I failed to provide you with a map of the Fertile Crescent. I hope this was not a mistake. <laughs> I hope so. It would certainly be a mistake if this were a college class. You know, I mean, I taught college for the last 10 years before I came here uh, in Pittsburgh, and to expect those folks to know anything outside their neighborhood in Allegheny County would be, would be too much. For now, anyway, let me show you the respect of not providing you a map of the Fertile Crescent. Okay. It's one of the things I've got to be, I know that everybody's not exactly the same place in, in, in the study of these, of these matters, but uh, perhaps in some future day I'll, I'll make you a map of the Fertile Crescent. You do have a map there, by the way. I took that map, stole that map offline, and altered it. And I'll explain that when we get to the map. You, you, those of you who've been in the class, you, you, are, you are familiar with that map. It's one I took offline, and then, being a high-tech person myself, mm -hmm. I, was, I was able to alter the map somewhat. The larger details of a map of the Fertile Crescent should be in the active memory and imagination of any literate person over about the age of 10 or so, I should think. Um, that would be about the time. I remember taking Phoenician history in sixth grade. Sixth grade, took Phoenician history. Uh, and it was just an ordinary little parochial school with 100 students and four classrooms. Uh, the Fertile Crescent is the good arable agricultural land that arches over the Arabian Desert. At its southeast end, it is anchored in the Persian Gulf, into which flow the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The proximity in the area is known as Mesopotamia, meaning in the midst of the waters, Potamos. Potamos is, 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 the, is, the, is the Greek word, isn't it? Uh, isn't it? Potamos is the Greek word for river. Potamos, Potamos Potamu. Second clinch. Yes, second clinch. Okay. <laughs> okay. I almost had me there for a minute. Potamos means river. Mesopotamia. That's, 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 your, that's your, your abstraction. Um, you get the word hippopotamus, a river, river horse, hippopotamus. At the other end of the Fertile Crescent, it includes the road to the Nile Valley. The territory of the Fertile Crescent included, is included in modern day Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, together with the northern region of Kuwait, the southeastern region of Turkey, and the western part of Iran. Sometimes the term is extended to include the island of Cyprus. And there's good reason for doing that. 
When we describe this relatively small region of the world as the cradle of civilization, trying to give it credit for the great many things invented and developed in this region. These include the domestication and cultivation of many articles of food, cereals, fruit trees and vines, peas, beans, other legumes, also the domestication of animals. At a very early period, cattle, sheep, pigs, a bit later horses, geese, and then it turned in the wrong direction, the domestication of the cat. <laughs> and we have not been the same since. <laughs> In this area is our first evidence for the digging of wells and artificial farms of irrigation. It is in this area that human beings began to mine and smelt metals, take, take advantage, artificial advantage, of the chemistry within the soil. They also invented the pottery wheel about that. And as we've already seen earlier, the use of lime to coat wells and cisterns for preserving the water. These same people also invented glass. At the eastern end of the Fertile Crescent lies the land of Sumeria. The culture of Sumeria, Sumeria gave us boats. I won't say, the boats are certainly earlier than the Sumer Sumerians. I'm just talking about the region. The boat is certainly earlier than the Sumerians. But it was, it was already boat traffic between Mesop what we call Mesopotamia and what we call India. It was already boat traffic <laughs> long before the Sumerians got there. It was, however, the Sumerians who at the end, toward the end of the third millennium before Christ, gave us the art of writing. To the western half of the Fertile Crescent, we owe the phonetic <coughs> alphabet. That, but that's further late. Okay? That's toward the end, toward the end of the second millennium before Christ. These are the peoples who gave us the earliest cities, the world's oldest continuing existing early, earliest city is Damascus. Older than Damascus, but not continually in existence. Jericho, Jericho, the origin of Jericho, that is, on the whole world, that's the that's earliest city. They gave us the first codification of laws, people in this area. Most of this area was inhabited by Semites, who were gradually driven west because of the arrival of the white man the white man coming down from the area of the Caspian Sea at the beginning of the second millennium before Christ and going in two directions and driving people as they went. One direction went in India, India okay, and drove the darker skinned people for the south, the Dasas for the south. On the, on the western, the, the western branch tend to push the Semites further west. Within the narrow geographical area between the Mesopotamian river systems and the Aegean Sea, within the narrow frame from 2000 to 500 BC, a very narrow frame of history, arose the alphabet, abstract science, formal logic, and monotheism. What was the last item of the topic? Monotheism. Our own history is tied to that region of the world and that restricted span of time.
I would suggest always having a map handy in principle when you're reading the Bible. It is possible, I suppose, to read the epistle of the Colossians without a map. But it'd be nice to know where Colossae is. <laughs> Some parts of the Bible don't even bother with the Bible if you don't have a map. Just don't even bother. You don't have any idea what it's about. And one of those is Genesis. But notice beginning, beginning with the story of Abraham, the path followed by Abraham, directly follows, in a westward progression, directly follows the photographic. The story of Abraham begins in Ur of the Chaldees. Okay. That's Ur long before the Chaldees ever got there. There were no, certainly no Chaldees, about Babylonians, at the time of Abraham. At least not the, not the people who in the Bible are called Chaldees. But it was still, Ur was definitely there. Ur was there. Abraham begins at Ur. Then he moves up to Haran, the very top of the Fulda Crescent, then down the other side, all the way down into Egypt. And when he goes down into Egypt, where Pharaoh promptly falls in love with his wife. <laughs> it's a little problem they had in that family. Everybody was always falling in love with this 90 year old woman. <laughs> now, there, those are my reflections on, on the Fertile Crescent. Now I want to look with you at this map when you were out there. I altered this map while we picked up somebody else. Oh, Carmen has joined us. Hi, Carmen. Carmen has joined us. Okay. I got this map offline. <coughs> Those of you who, who have the map online, it's colored, so you, you're doing a little better. My printer does only black and white, so I, I, that, that's what you have in front of you, unless you ran off the map at home with, with your own much better printer than mine. But this line, very thin line, runs the entire length, very thin line, I put that I put that line in myself. Are you going to ask me how I did that? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a line. It seems to me it's essential to the understanding of the map. It's a line of what's called the King's Highway. The King's Highway. And the map is online, and and, and all of you got that map, by the way. Carmen sent it out to, to everybody. Everybody got that map. So it'd be on your computer. I made that line red. Okay, but, but it's a very thin line, the King's Highway. The King's Highway joins the Euphrates River with the Gulf of Aqaba. That line I put in myself. I also put in this other little line running, running west at the bottom. That's, that's the road between the Nile River and Arabia. It runs, it touches the top of the Gulf of Suez, touches the top of the Gulf of, of, uh, uh, of Eilat, okay. uh, the Gulf of uh, Aqaba, or Eilat, and then continues west into Arabia, those two. Up here at the top, your map, talk about, uh, how did they pronounce it here? Okay, I'll put it, I'll put it in the Hebrew name. Tifsa, Tifsa, see that up at the top? Tifsa is the traditional ford over Euphrates River. Okay. It's crossed by the King's Highway. In exactly the same place, it's crossed in an eastern western direction by the road that links Anatolia and the Aegean Sea, all the way, all the way east uh, to the Persian Gulf. Tifsa. Y yes, sir. This case highway still is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it is. <laughs> look, look it up online. It gives you the actual number, the highway number, of each place where it is. 
it changes numbers as it goes through countries, but it's, it's still very much in use. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh. <laughs> you now have modern oases there. Yeah, yeah, you have, you have truck stops. Yeah, you have tr truck stops. Yeah. The truck stops have replaced the palm trees. Yes. Oh yes, that Tifsa, by the way. Uh, well, I'll talk about it. I'll talk about that pretzel. I'll talk about Tifsa. That's an extremely important place. Extremely important place. Two great crossways cross here, and exactly the ford of the, of the river. Uh, First time I ran into that place, I did. I would, I, we're, not in, we're not in the Bible. First time I ran into that place it was when I was a young Greek student uh, teaching myself Greek. And uh, I think the first classical author, I'm, I'm positive, the first classical, classical author I read was Xenophon Zanabasis. In fact, I, I, not so long ago, I found a little spiral notebook among my things that I of all the vocabulary words. I kept that little spiral notebook. I wrote down every single word. And uh, so, so I would I've memorized all the words. I wrote every single word. I was reading reading Xenophon, every single word, and wrote, the, wrote it down. But uh, the, way, the way Xenophon describes uh, the, the, how the Greeks crossed the, the Euphrates River, uh, they, they, filled, uh, they filled pigskins. Pretty much the same philosophy as a football, and they and they put, filled them with air, put them down, and put a put, put a pontoon bridge over it. <laughs> okay. he, well, he describes that. In fact, in the in the I remember what, what edition I had of this is so this is so very very long ago. I was quite young at the time. It's I think it's about uh, seventy years ago. Or so like uh, well, those notes are really old, aren't they? Um, but he describes how they how they crossed the, crossed that river. Now, I'm going to go with this text. It's on the other side of the map, and this is a review. First Samuel 14:47. So Saul established his reign over Israel. This is about 10:20, the beginning of the reign of Saul, about 10:20. So Saul established his reign over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab. If you want to see that on your on your map, the Moabites. Uh, this area, right down here, to the, to, to the east of the of the, Dead, of the Dead Sea. Against the people of Ammon, that's further north. Against Edom, that's to the south. Against the kings of Zobah. Now Zobah. Is a, is a, a rather large area up, up, up on either side of Damascus. It's well, well to the north. So Zobah is not a city. It's a it's a it's a desert region. But but not just a desert region. Zobah, for example, would include something like the the the, uh, uh, the, the, the Baca Valley, the Baca Valley, which is certainly not desert. It's very rich. That's in eastern, eastern, eastern Lebanon. <coughs> against the kings of Zobah, against the Philistines, that, of course, the Philistines is what we now call the Gaza Strip. The Philistines were uh, where the Palestinians are now, although those are not the same people. There's no relationship between them historically at all. They're not the same people. And he gathered an army and destroyed Amalek. Amalek is to the south, <coughs> down the Judean desert. And delivered Israel from the hand of its plunder. First Samuel fifteen seven. Saul destroyed the Amalekites simply from Havilah, all the way down to Shur, which is east of Egypt. Now, that is what gives you that what gives you this line down here. In other words, Saul controlled all the traffic between Egypt and Arabia. That little Israel controlled that traffic. That's a, that, that's a tremendous thing. First Chronicles eight, Chronicles eighteen, beginning with the reign of David. Now. After this, it came to pass that David struck the Philistines and subdued them, and took Gath and its towns from the hand of the Philistines. It was David's subjection to the Philistines, who were European people who settled in the Holy Land about the same time as the Israelites. And he struck Moab, and the Moabites became David's servants, and they brought tribute. And David struck Hadadezer, the king of Zobah, up to Hamath, and he went to establish his the power by the river Euphrates. You see that? Revivate his way up the extreme northeast 
of your map there. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of, of the Syrians. David put garrisons in, in Syria of Damascus. And the Syrians became David's servants and they brought tribute. That is that little, that little kingdom controlled Syria. That's, that's, that's a, it's almost unthinkable, right? but, but, but it happened. Now when, when To, the king of Hamath, heard that David had struck all the army of Hadadezer, king of Zobah, he sent Adoram, his son, to King David to greet him and bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and struck him, and all kinds of articles of gold, silver, and bronze. It was tribute. These become satellite states of David's kingdom. King David also delivered these to the Lord, dedicated these to the Lord, along with the silver and gold that he, struck, that he had brought from all the nations, from Edom, from Moab, from all the people of Ammon, from the Philistines, and from Amalek. He also put garrisons in Edom, and all the Edomites became David's servants. Now the Edomites live down in this region here. Taking the Edomites, it gives him access to the sea in the south, at the Gulf of Aqaba, the city of Elad, oh, the city of Aqaba, uh, uh, they're, they're, two, they're pretty much merged together now. Uh, Aqaba is, is the Arabic name, and the Elad is the, is the Hebrew name, which gives them an opening now to the to the to the Red Sea, and through the Red Sea to all points east, uh, all points east and, and south. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, for Second Chronicles one fifteen, also the king the king Solomon made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stones. First Kings four twenty four. This is a description of Solomon. By the way, it says he and Solomon there. He had dominion over all this side of the river from Tifsa, way up here. Tifsa, that's the Greek Thapsacus, up there. That's the city I was just describing as the as the ford for two roads going across the, the Euphrates River, even to Gaza, with the Gaza Strip way down here. Namely, over all the kings on this side of the river, the river is the Euphrates, and he had peace on every side all around him. That's that's a description of the reign of uh, of Solomon. Hang on just a minute. First Kings 5, 1. Now, but this is going to be about Phoenicia. Here's Phoenicia here on your map, just to the north of Israel. Mm -hmm. Phoenicia is what we today call Lebanon. These are the great seafaring people. David, in conquering the Philistines, freed up the mercantile ambitions of the Phoenicians. And so there was a, going to be a, a close relationship between Israel and the Phoenicians. And that's going to be very beneficial from the point of view of finance, money, prosperity, all those good things. Okay? And very bad spiritually, because the Phoenicians were really bad dudes with, with regard to certain things. Uh, they've cleaned up their acts since, I'm going to understand. That. I saw I saw Beirut back before the before the war, when it was really a fantastic city. Some of you can't even remember before the war. You don't know what war I'm talking about. You think it's the War of 1812? Not quite. <laughs> anyway, David makes peace with Hiram, the king of Tyre, which of course is one of the capitals of Phoenicia. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that the, they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram had always loved David. So the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and they both made a covenant. That's an international treaty. It's gonna be a trade, trade treaty, treaty. And also, the big project for Solomon is gonna be the construction of the temple. <coughs> The construction of the temple is going to get granite from Phoenicia and cedar. 
Next, Egypt. Egypt, at least a little bit of Egypt is in the extreme southwest of, of this map, but that's just, that's just the edge of Egypt. <coughs> Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. And he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house, the house of the Lord, and the wall all around Jerusalem. Now that's very important. Solomon now has, see if you marry somebody's daughter in those days, the king married somebody's daughter, a princess, you know, that means there's a, the, the money goes with it. Business follows it. Obviously, there's peace between Solomon and, and, and Egypt, which you probably would not have expected when you remember the, the previous stories about Israel being slaves in Egypt. Obviously, things have changed. This, is, this apparently happened, this, we don't know exactly when the wedding took place, but it apparently happened during the 21st dynasty, toward the end of the 20, 21st dynasty, which was a weak dynasty. In fact, if it had been a strong dynasty, Solomon and David and Saul couldn't have done any of these things. In, in earlier dynasty, Egypt ruled this whole area. The fact that, that the, the Israelites did these things in, in the, uh, toward the end of the 11th century and in, into the 10th century, um, it, it tells you that Egypt was weak. Uh, okay. First Kings 10. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the reign of a fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones, when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. We don't know all, all that was that was in her heart, but some of it had to do with mercantile arrangements. Now, this area, on this map, this area, joins two great empire, mercantile empires. Up here, is the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. It's going to be controlled very much, over more and more. It's going to be controlled by the Phoenician navies, the Phoenician merchants. Heavy trade between Phoenicia and Egypt. Okay. The Phoenicians move out north into the Black Sea. The Phoenicians will very soon find themselves at the mouth of the Danube, okay. way up into the Sea of Azov, the mouth of the Don, the mouth of the Dnieper, the mouth of the Volga. They got that far. The Phoenicians move out across the Mediterranean, planting colonies. The most famous of these was Carthage. Carthage plants colonies. The most famous of these would be Cartagena in Spain. The Phoenicians would put, put colonies all over the, the Mediterranean. The Phoenicians, 2,000 years before Vasco da Gama, 2,000 years before Vasco da Gama, the Phoenicians went through the Straits of Gibraltar and around the west coast of Africa. 2,000 years before Vasco da Gama, the Phoenicians. That is a lot of trade. It's an enormous trading network. Okay. The stuff that they want that they can only get through Solomon. Because Solomon is the one who has access to the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba, to the Red Sea. Solomon has that, okay? Now, the Queen of Sheba, Sheba is, is a kingdom that sits at the, at the bottom of the, of the Arabian Peninsula. That was a great trading network all around the east coast, around the heart of Africa, all the way over, um, all the way over to, uh, to India. Mm -hmm. So these two great trading networks, Solomon is the link between them. Money is pouring in. <laughs> Prior to this expansion of Israel, the Israelites were, had been farmers, and subsistence farmers. 
because the law forbade the alienation of property past one generation, the famous Jubilee Law, which meant as the population grew, the farms got smaller. Got the picture? Solomon comes in and changes all of that. It makes it now possible for you to sell your property, move into the city, where instead of working 14 hours a day, you're going to work eight hours a day. You're going to clock. You're going to you're going to clock in with your with your with your whatever you clock in with. <laughs> and people liked that. It meant there'd be the swelling, the swelling of the cities, which is going to create eventually an urban proletariat. And down the road, that's going to create enormous problems, as we shall see when we eventually get to the eighth century prophets. Because people like Amos and, and Isaiah have a lot to say about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but for now, everything is, is, is going fine. Any questions so far? Okay. <clears throat> okay, the prosperity. Okay. Solomon was able to do this, David was able to do this, because of a, of a geopolitical vacuum at this particular time. Israel was able to carve out a small empire, subduing the Philistines, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Syrians, making mercantile arrangements with sea-going Phoenicians to the north, and the sea-going peoples of, of, uh, of Sheba. Now, Solomon inherited all of this from David when David died in 961. It is possible that in all of history, Solomon had no equal in his ability to read maps and ledgers. His father having incorporated the Edomites to the south, Solomon controlled the port in the Gulf of Elath, or Aqaba, and access to the Red Sea and to all the markets south of the Red Sea. He didn't have to build a single ship. The ships were all provided by, by Sheba. I mean, they've been doing this for centuries. He did not have to build a single ship up, up in the Mediterranean Aegean Seas. The Phoenicians did that. What did he have to do? He had to get the products to and from these two regions. That's all. For that, he could make use of what? The King's Highway. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm thinking about the King's Highway and also the highway on the other side, to the, to the west. Of the, there's another highway. But anyway, what I'm thinking is how do you get the, how do you get them going? Well, the, the, he, the Teamsters they had a big union. <laughs> no, actually, it's pre Teamsters. It's pre Teamsters. <laughs> okay. Because in, in fact, the horse is not that it's not that useful unless he's pulling a wagon. I mean, you've got better people to pull wagons. The big, the big pack animal is going to be camel. the camel. The domestication of the camel sometime around the year 1200. The domestication of the camel. The camel appears, by camel here, of course, I mean dromedary. I, I do know the difference, but I, you know, I mean, I, I would walk a mile for a dromedary, but that's not how they, they, they uh, that's not, not, not what the song says. Uh, the dromedary appears as a pack animal on Egyptian pottery around the 12th, 12th century BC. Prior to that, it was, it was a donkey or something. But the camel starts to make its appearance. Uh, okay. To the north, Israel is bordered by the Phoenicians, whose shipping merchants were delivering and picking up cargo at ports all around the Mediterranean basin. Looking at this picture, Solomon decided to go into business, serving as a middleman between the Phoenician markets in the Mediterranean and the sundry mercantile opportunities around the Red Sea. It was a time of booming material affluence. The most important thing that happened right before that was the mining and smelting of iron for the first time, the beginning of the Iron Age. 
Why didn't they? Because they knew about iron and knew the qualities of iron prior to that. Why didn't they not smelt iron? They couldn't get the fires hot enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have all these big improvements on furnaces. That, that comes right, right, at the, right at the end of the, of the 11th century BC. Big improvements on furnaces. So now you can, you can actually just smelt iron in, in large quantities. Uh, that's a technical, a technical achievement, the better furnace uh, for, for, the, for the smelting and, and, uh, and the fashioning of, 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 of iron. Uh, I've talked about, I've already spoken about the uh, use of lime to cope the cisterns, the alphabet, the camel, and the iron. Iron gives us much better tools, farm tools, plowshares, axes, various kinds of knives, machetes, and things of this sort for harvesting, which, which cuts down on the amount of labor, which means fewer people need to, need to be doing the farming. So for, sons are freed up to move in, into, the, into the city, take city jobs, uh, learning, learning how to drive camels, for example. Yes, honey. What jobs would be in the city? The moving of products. The moving, moving of products. You see, already with the city, you have this, this, this phenomenon of a division of labor. The division of labor is one of the most important things that the development is brought around by the city. It means not everybody has to do everything. You don't have to, you don't have to make your own shoes anymore. In fact, you can get somebody else to bake your bread. I mean, I mean, most people thought that was a little bit extreme, but 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 you didn't. You, somebody else would bake your bread. You didn't have to grow everything your family's going to eat, because you can you can go in, you can go into the village. And and they've recently brought in figs. <laughs> figs from further north. I think the figs come from much further north. The, the, the original figs. I'd have to look that up for sure because it's a it's a fading memory. But anyway, all kind, there's all kinds of jobs, including government jobs. <laughs> and there wasn't that big a difference between government and business. There never has been, by the way, that big a difference between government and business. Never has been. But you, you would have a, you, you could get a job making shoes, making clothing, uh, things need to be constructed. Machinery needs to be made. Um, axes, plowshares, things like that. These need to be produced. So there are all kinds of new jobs, but especially in business. Yeah, we, I, think, I think the child's surviving. <laughs> yes, sir? Yeah, I was going to ask too, since the, now there's less labor needed to do things because of the technology would you say that the average person's spiritual life had there was more time for that? Thank you. That was actually the very, very next thing on the page. Can you restate the question? Uh, yes, yes. George is asking, doesn't this doesn't this lead to leisure? And the culture based on leisure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Culture based on leisure. People learn now how to read and write. You can do that now. In fact, schools have to be started because a, a, uh, a literate class must be produced simply to carry on the business and the government. You have to have a literate, you have to have a literate class, people who can read and write and count you know? uh, so they can be part of the economy. Once they learn how to read and write and count, they've got time on their hands. So you produce literature. The reign of Solomon produced some very important literature. One of the things produced by the reign of Solomon was a long story of how the house of David came to be the heirs. The, 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 two, books, the two books of Samuel were written at this time. Uh, some parts, some parts of, of, of the Pentateuch also seem to have come from this time, uh, based on earlier memories. But some parts of the, of the Pentateuch, 
appear to be derived uh, from this particular period. I don't want to go into that because then we it gets very much into hypothesis. But certainly the books of the book of Proverbs, your core, your, your core of the book of Proverbs comes from the reign of Solomon. In fact, Solomon is, is credited with this. So you start to get a leisured class, an intellectual class, a class that can reflect and write history and other kinds of literature. It was during this, this particular period that there's the first codification of some parts of the book of Psalms for the temple worship. We know that in the, in the period before the, the before the temple, a famous choir director of, uh, of David, a man by the name of Asaph. Asaph wrote some of the psalms, got some of the important psalms. I deal with that somewhere in the, in the later edition of, of, of my book on the psalms. So, very good, George. Yes, sir. I have a, on... a little louder. You, are you talking about Solomon as a conqueror? Yes. Yeah, no, Solomon did not. Sorry? Solomon did not do that. No, no, no. They, 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 Solomon inherited this. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say that. Yeah. So my question is, when he, when the Moabites are under the rule of, you know, the king of Judah, right? Or, um, would you say that they, Oh, that, 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 that's, that, that's a good, it's a good question for another time. Okay. This is, this is off the subject of the, uh, clearly some did, but, but not usually. But it wasn't enforced. Like, my question is, do you think that because they had to pay tribute, that there were some restrictions set on them? Or? I have no idea, son. Okay. I, I have no idea. I've never given a thought of that. Uh, that, 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 that's way too speculative, and I'm not sure we got the data even to address that question, frankly. I don't want to discourage you, though. <laughs> okay, any other questions? How much time do I have, Nancy? Would you guess? <laughs> no clue. All no right. I guess until the kids come in. All right, okay. Right. Yes, yes, Father Deacon. Okay, very good. Uh, glory to the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit, now and ever, the God who is, who was, is to come at the end of time. Amen. Two weeks from now, we will take the beginning of the 22nd Egyptian dynasty, Pharaoh Shishank, and the big difference that will make, and that will lead to the civil war within Israel, so the, after the death of Solomon, this kingdom breaks into the, the north and the south, two kingdoms. The loss of the Edomites means the loss of the southern markets, and uh, things start to fall apart.